Hello and welcome to Calvary Chapel Comic Key. This will be the message for the 18th of April, 2021, as we complete our study in the book of Habakkuk. Today is chapter 3, and the title of the message is, Jesus, I Trust You. So many of you who know me know that that's been kind of my motto for a long time now. That's something that the Lord has shown me as I have been growing in who He is and my identity in Him. I'm learning each day and even moment by moment to trust him better as he empowers me by his spirit and by his word. And so Jesus is someone that we truly can trust because he's a faithful one. He's a trustworthy savior and he's everything that we need. So those of us in Christ, we now know that no matter what, no matter the situation or the circumstance, he is trustworthy and he is our rock and our salvation. He's our foundation, and He's everything that we need. So in Habakkuk 2.4, kind of the key verse of the whole book, in this three-chapter book, it's very important, let me read it, uh, Habakkuk 2.4, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so we've talked in depth about that. And so to, to bring this to a conclusion in chapter 3, um, we see that no matter what, Jesus is there and he is trustworthy. And so uh, chapter 3, there's 19 verses. And we see in many ways that it's a prayer. We see that it's a song. And we see that it is a praise. And we'll see that as we go through it. And we're gonna, just going to take a little bit at a time in the 19 verses. So let me just start with uh, verse 1 in chapter 3. It says, a, pra a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, on a Shiganoth. And so that word Shiganoth is not really, uh, no one really knows exactly what that means, but there's some things that, that lean toward it could be a musical instrument. And because of that, and when we glance at verse 19, let me read the very last part of verse 19. To the chief musician with my stringed instruments. So when we connect those things, we see that it's very possible that it's a musical instrument. And so this prayer of Habakkuk is actually like a psalm or a song. And uh, it's this guy Habakkuk, this prophet, um, you know, praying to the Lord and then really receiving from the Lord this idea that, Lord, no matter what you're doing, I can trust you. And so in chapter 3, he puts it in a song uh, form, like a psalm. And uh, we'll see some things as we go through this chapter that will indicate that that's quite possible. So let me read verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So remember Habakkuk, he started with a prayer. And he cries out to the Lord in chapter 1. And, and he's speaking to the Lord about the evil that's in his country. In the southern part of Israel, in Judah. So the northern tribes have already been taken captive in Assyria. And this is just before Babylon comes in and takes the southern kingdom, Judah, captive. So all that leading up to Habakkuk pleading with the Lord and praying and crying out to him. And so he gets a very shocking answer in that the Lord tells Habakkuk that he's going to use Babylon, this um, pagan empire, to come in and take Judah captive and actually to serve the Lord in his purpose. But it's always with a heart of love from God himself toward his people. So specifically, you know, God loving his people, Israel, he's using pagan nations uh, for his purposes and to really set forth his plan of reconciliation and redemption in a bigger picture. And so a prayer, a song, and a praise. So Habakkuk may have been a Levite because of this. Many Bible scholars think that it's very possible so I've been doing some study about, you know, the Levites. They were set aside. They didn't have their own property, their own land. Uh, they were to serve the Lord um, as the tribe of Levi in the tabernacle and in the temple. And so we can read in 1 Chronicles chapter 9 and 1 Chronicles chapter 15 some specifics. I'll let you do that on your own. 
uh, even some names brought forth that were um, Levites, but they had special duties with music and, you know, leading the, the people of God in praise and worship, if you will. And so let me read Psalm 134, verses 1 and 2. It's a song of ascents. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. So we see in Chronicles and then later in Psalms that uh, there's a part of the Levites that are set aside to be in the temple in worship night and day. In Psalm 135, verses 1 through 3, it says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. So we see that uh, uh, throughout history with Israel, there's been people set aside by the Lord, ordained by him to lead praise uh, and worship to the Lord. And you know, it's really a heart condition. We know from Jesus' teaching, he's always looking into the heart. And when our heart is pressed into the Lord, as we're seeking to follow him and we're surrendered to his love in us, uh, then he also renew, renews our mind, but he changes our heart. And our heart can be changed into a heart of thanksgiving and praise to him, glorifying the Lord. So all the goodness of him in us is reflected back now to him in praise and worship. And so that's a working of the Holy Spirit. And so, so we see that uh, in verse 2, O Lord, I've heard your speech and I was afraid. Um, I just love verse 2. It says, Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So we're, we're seeing uh, this change in Habakkuk's attitude and in his heart and his expressions. So basically what he's saying in verse 2 is, Lord, I don't necessarily understand why you're going to use Babylon. Lord, I don't understand what you're doing in my circumstance, in my situation. But Lord, I trust you to the point. Please keep doing your work. Lord, I may not understand what you're doing, but I see that I can trust you. And Lord, now I'm asking you to please continue your work. And so we can personalize that even with our own lives in the Lord. We can say, Lord, I don't understand the circumstance that you have me in right now. Lord, what I see uh, in my life is confusing and it's painful. But Lord, I can look beyond those things and I can see that I can trust you to the point where I now I, my prayer to you, Lord, is, Lord, keep doing your work, even though I don't understand it, even though right now it's very painful. And so we can, by the working of the Spirit and trusting the Lord as we go through His Word, uh, we can be able to say like Habakkuk, Lord, I trust you to the point where I'm asking you to keep doing your work because, see, I know you have the perfect plan and you have the big picture and you understand things uh, so much better than I do. So, Lord, I trust you in an extreme level. To the point where I say, Lord, keep doing your work in my life, in the lives of my family, in the lives of my, uh, in my community, you know, in, in the lives of the whole world right now. Lord, do your work because it's always going to be perfect in every way. And so that's what we see in this, uh, in verse 2. Let me read verse 3. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now notice at the end of that phrase in verse 3, it says Selah. Selah. Uh, you might recognize that from the book of Psalms. In fact, in Psalms it's used 71 times, and we see it three times here in this chapter. So 71 times in Psalms, there's this phrase. Uh, so it's used often in the book of Psalms. And so uh, I want to read kind of a definition from the Amplified Bible. It says, Selah can mean to pause and calmly ponder that. In other words, 
So I get to this first phrase in verse 3, God came from Teman, the Holy One from out Paran. Then it says to pause and calmly ponder that. And so, you know, when we're in the Lord and we're in His Word, uh, that's what the Holy Spirit can do. He can calm us, He can settle our minds, and we can, we, we can uh, read a passage. And all of a sudden, by the work of the Spirit, it goes right into our heart. And it's like that nugget that we needed for that moment. It's that word that we absolutely were praying for. You know, if you're like me, before I start reading, I, st I just start praying to myself, Lord, would you reveal yourself to me? Would you show me something from you uh, that I need for this moment? And, and you know what? He will do that. Uh, so we may not understand everything that we read, but I promise you, if we read in that attitude, an attitude of prayer, uh, an attitude of, Lord, reveal yourself, he is glad to do that. So Selah, calmly pause and ponder this. And so many would say that, especially connected with the Psalms, uh, that this can be uh, connected with music. Like um, in music, when you're reading, uh, you know, the notes and everything, sometimes there's a rest. And so you pause right there and, and we can connect that with this. But God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. We're going to see it twice more in this chapter. And so, let me, let me finish the verse. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Uh, so it goes on to show the strength of the Lord and how he's working. So, so as soon as Habakkuk has this hard attitude of verse 2, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing and why you're doing that, but I trust you enough to say, Lord, continue to do your work. You know, for me in my life, experiences with the Lord when I get to that place of completely trusting the Lord that's when he really uh, tends to reveal his himself to me in a deeper way that I have a better understanding of who he is in my life and what he's doing even around me and so it's very interesting that that's where uh, we find Habakkuk right now uh, so it also connects with Selah is a picture of the Lord's rest. We read in Hebrews chapter 4, I'll leave that to read on your own, that Christ is our rest. He is our perfect rest. And we can always rely on resting in Him. He is our Sabbath is another way of saying that. And so He's the perfect picture of what Sabbath is uh, all about. And He is our specific, unique Sabbath in our rest, in perfection. We rest in Him regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the situation. Uh, we can always rest in Him. He's the one that's always inviting us to rest in Him. Selah. And so, I also want to connect now. Well, what does it mean by God came from Teman and the Holy One from out Paran? And so, we can go to Isaiah chapter 63 and connect some dots. So, go back to the left in the the book of Isaiah chapter 63 and let's let's kind of connect some dots here I'll just read for a bit in Isaiah 63 starting with verse 1 the Bible says who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra this one who is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength that's a question and then the Lord answers that question. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So, so just holding your place in Habakkuk, we find out uh, geographically Teman and Mount Paran is in Edom. And that would be south of Israel over on the east side. And remember, um, Edom was settled by Esau, who was the brother of Jacob. Jacob became Israel, but they were brothers. And remember the story that Jacob deceived his brother and, and actually won his birthright and then also ultimately the blessing from his father? And so, so Esau uh, settles in Edom, which is south of Israel, and that's the place where Teman and this Mount Paran are located. But back in Isaiah 63, we see that this is a prophecy of the Lord's salvation. Now, this is probably uh, at the end of what's 
known as the Great Tribulation. And it says that uh, the Lord is coming from Edom with his garments um, dyed from Basra. Basra is a place in Edom. Uh, and it says that he's traveling in the greatness of his strength. And the Lord says, it's me. It's I who speak in righteousness mighty to save. Verse 2, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? The next question in Isaiah 63. Here's the answer in verse 3. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden, trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my, the year of my redeem has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there is, was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. So it goes on. If you wanted to finish Isaiah 63, you're going to see that it matches really beautifully with Habakkuk chapter 3, the same progression. But we see that this is probably indicating the end of the Great Tribulation. The Lord himself is the one that is bringing salvation by his powerful right arm, all by himself, without any help. And we see uh, in the New Testament, he actually does it by the word of his mouth. Um, and, and so there's such power in what he says that he brings things to a conclusion perfectly. Now, this is the Lord bringing judgment on the heathen, the ones who say no thank you to his salvation. But, you know, the first time that the Lord offered salvation, we see that in Isaiah 61. If you want to back up a couple chapters, I will just read a little bit, and it matches perfectly with Luke chapter 4, if you're taking notes. And I'll let you read that on your own. But in Isaiah 61, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Obviously, this is speaking of the Messiah. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where um, in Luke 4, it stops right there. But it goes on in Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, after the day of the vengeance, or after the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And I'll let you finish um, that chapter, Isaiah 61. But let's go back to Habakkuk chapter 3, as we're kind of connecting dots for a little bit here. Um, so he comes from the south, southern part uh, near Israel, uh, known as Edom, uh, and it says in the, the latter part of verse 3, His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from His hand, and there was power, and there His power was hidden. Before Him went pestilence, and fever followed at His feet. He stood and measured the earth, and looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered, the perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan and affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. I'm going to let you do a little bit of Bible study and to find out where Cushan is and where Midian is. You'll, you'll be surprised where they are. O oh Lord, you, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. And now in the middle of verse 9, we have that word selah, you know, pause, and 
quietly or calmly ponder this. Let me move on to finish verse 9. You divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered, uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went, and the shining of your glittering spear. Verse 12, you marched through the land in indignation. You know, generally, especially in the Old Testament, when we see the word indignation, you know, speaking of God's wrath, it's speaking of this tribulation period. And so, so Habakkuk and Isaiah, they didn't necessarily understand exactly what that was, but but they were led by the Spirit and they wrote. And so we have, uh, we have God's Word to show us there's this future time where God's wrath will be poured out upon the earth and it will affect uh, the heathen, the ones who um, are refusing the love of Christ, the Messiah and his salvation. So indignation, verse 12, you trampled the nations in anger. Nations can generally be... Um, kind of interpreted as heathens. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. See, that's speaking of the Messiah there. The anointed is translated Messiah, Mashiach in Hebrew. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from the foundation to the neck. And then notice this final Selah to pause and calm, calmly ponder this. You know, ponder the Messiah and what he's doing, what he's done and what he's doing now and what he will do. Uh, you th thrust through in verse 14 with his own arrows, the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses through the heap of great waters. Verse 16, when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So we see this battle that's going to rage. It's kind of good and evil, but we know the ending where the anointed one, the Messiah himself, will lead his people in victory and triumph. And then finally, the last section is kind of this hymn of faith, this song of trusting Jesus, ultimately. Verse 17, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, here it is, kind of uh, the, the grand finish here, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Verse 19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. To the chief musician with stringed instruments. So we see it's a song. It's a hymn. It's a psalm. And it's a praise. It's all of that together. And what Habakkuk experienced and now wants to pass along to the following generations is that we can absolutely trust Jesus. And when we do, we can get to the point where uh, we are now um, giving back to the Lord praise and honor uh, that we're glorifying him, that we have this heart of thanksgiving no matter the situation. And so uh, in verse 17, um, Habakkuk is expressing that though I may lose everything, that I, I don't have anything to lean upon. There's nothing in this wor world that I can uh, put my hope in and my trust in. That all fades away, and yet that doesn't change who Jesus is. And he is my rock and my refuge and my strength and my shelter. All these things that the anointed one is to us, the Mashiach. And so there is cause for rejoicing. And why for us uh, right now, for this moment, even in a world that is full of chaos and evil, it's because it's Christ in us. And he is our hope of glory. Uh, let me read from Matthew 19, 26 as we finish up here. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, 
With men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Speaking of who can be saved, you know, really the miracle of salvation, but in a bigger sense even, you know, really anything in our flesh doesn't work. It's going to be a waste of time. If we labor in our own strength, then it's, it's going to fail. But when we put our trust in Jesus, then no matter what's happening, happening in our circumstances, in our, even in our own personal life, we can trust him to get us through. And so we have eternity with Christ as his disciple, as his follower, as one who has now put our trust in him to the point where when he said, on the cross, it is finished, we absolutely believe that, and now we're living that idea out. Uh, and so it's more than just an idea now. Now it's a reality, and I'm living my life in this reality of trusting Jesus no matter what. Because, see, I've already tried everything else. That didn't work. But trusting Jesus never fails. Now, Colossians 1.27 to finish up. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what we have like Habakkuk had is Christ in us. Now, for Habakkuk, Christ was a future um, anointed Messiah coming to the earth as even the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. But the Lord gave him revelation knowledge that the Lord ultimately will be that conquering king. And so we saw that in chapter 3. So, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. There's nothing righteous in that person, the one who is uh, prideful. But the just shall live by faith. And friend, I hope that's you. And so as we trust Jesus together uh, as the church of God, we are anticipating the return of the Messiah, the conquering king. And so I see scripture saying that we have not been appointed to God's wrath. You know, there's going to be a time where God's wrath will be poured out on the earth. And we're going to see that the church will be removed before his wrath is poured out. And during that time, we'll see this this work of salvation for God's people, Israel. See, God's not done with Israel. We see that in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 especially, uh, but other parts of the, of the Word of God. And we're going to see that the Lord will supernaturally protect His people during this time of wrath, uh, His people, Israel. But the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles right now by the working of His grace, and we're saved uh, by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. When that happens by the working of the Spirit, simultaneously there's this thing called repentance where we make this 180, we go from walking our own way, now we're walking the way of the Lord. And so I hope that's you. And I hope you've been blessed by this small three-chapter book of Habakkuk. But even though it's small, it's a very powerful message. And there's there's parts of it that we can live by day by day, moment by moment, as we trust the Lord. So the title of the message is, Jesus, I Trust You, based on Habakkuk 2.4. I pray that that would become very important in your life, and that would become kind of etched on your heart, you know, saying, Jesus, I trust you. And Lord, help me uh, when I have unbelief. He's big enough to, to help us through that as well. And so until next time, God bless.